नमस्कार प्राध्यापक राम बापट स्मृती व्याख्यान मालेच्या वतीनं मी आपल्या सर्वांचं मनापासून स्वागत करतो आज या व्याख्यान मालेतलं पहिलं व्याख्यान इथं होणार आहे आणि हे पहिलं पुष्प गुंफणार आहेत श्रीयुत सदानंद मेनन या व्याख्यानाच्या अध्यक्षस्थानी आहेत प्रख्यात विचारवंत नाटककार आणि प्राध्यापक राम बापट यांचे मित्र प्राध्यापक गोपू देशपांडे मी मकरंद साठे यांना विनंती करतो की त्यांनी श्रीयुत सदानंद मेनन आणि प्राध्यापक गोपू देशपांडे यांना मंचावर घेऊन यावं या व्याख्यानमालेला आर्थिक सहाय्य करणाऱ्या प्राज फाउंडेशनच्या संचालिका श्रीमती परिमल चौधरी यांना मी विनंती करतो की त्यांनी श्री सदानंद मेनन आणि प्राध्यापक गोपू देशपांडे यांचं पुष्पगुच्छ देऊन स्वागत करावं सदानंद मेनन आणि गोपू देशपांडे यांना विनंती करतो की बापट सरांच्या प्रतिमेला त्यांनी पुष्पहार अर्पण करावा आणि या व्याख्यानमालेचं उद्घाटन करावं करंद साठे तुम्हाला विनंती करतो की मेन मेनन यांचा परिचय करून द्यावा आणि प्राध्यापक राम बापट स्मृती व्याख्यान माला सुरू करण्यामागची भूमिका थोडक्यात मांडावी नमस्कार आपल्या सगळ्यांचं स्वागत थोडक्यात भूमिका म्हणतो आपल्याचे वक्ते हे महाराष्ट्र बाहेरच आहेत त्याच्यामुळे मी इंग्रजीतच त्यांचाही परिचय देतो आणि आमची भूमिकाही आपल्याला सांगतो बोथ माय सेल्फ अँड गजानन परांजपे हॅड अ ग्रेट फॉर्च्युन ऑफ बिंग क्रोज टू प्राध्यापक बापट फॉर मेनी डेकेड्स ॲक्च्युली मोर दॅन नियरली ॲटलीस्ट थ्री डेकेड्स वी रीप द बेनिफिट ऑफ ऑल ऑल द इंटरॅक्शन्स अँड विथ हिम इफ वी स्टील लॅक आय एम सर्टन दॅट वी we still lack like many things it's not because of him it's because we could not absorb everything that he offered us we 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 are by no means alone in this there were hundreds of people who uh, benefited from speaking to him from getting exposed to different ideas through him there were writers and artists like us directors even in more number intellectuals political activists social activists in many spheres of this Uh, 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 not only Pune city, but entirely uh, at nation and a few people from even outside nation. Uh, there were many uh, qualities that were very specific to ba ba Bapat, in my opinion, which I feel I should talk about. Uh, first thing is that he was he was not only an exceptional intellect. Uh, all of us meet uh, a few intellects who are exceptional in analytical capacities but it was that but beyond that he had a vast range of 
capacities which could synthesize different subjects together, which could locate a particular point, a particular problem in a uh, in, in a genuine sense, he was a uh, multifaceted genius, and such a person is very rare to find, especially in today's world where specializations are so rampant. Secondly, he was uh, uh, he, he, he was a real, in the real sense, a public intellectual, which is again a rarity to today. We are having different divisions in the society. We talk about economic divisions, about urban and rural division, gender division, caste, obviously division. One of the divisions is basically between that is developing more and more wider is between the intellectuals, the artists, the workers, the political workers, social workers, and the common public. Bapat single-handedly tried to bridge these gaps uh, throughout his life. Uh, we wanted to continue his work. We obviously have the uh, understanding that we are in no position or we don't have the way, whether we have to do so. The only way we could do it was to get people like him with a, 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 as much wild world, uh, wide world view to speak here every year. Uh, so we decided to organize this uh, lecture series, which will be there, one lecture per year. We have planned for the first four years to start with, because on, we are organizing it as individuals. That gives us the freedom. Bapat was associated with many organizations of different views. So we have invited all of them. All of them have supported us. We are very happy for that. But this gives us the freedom of uh, bringing in all kinds of people inside. We, are, we, we would very much like youth of Pune City to to come here as we were benefited, let them get benefited. Uh, we are very happy, I must say, that this, this kind of work cannot be done without some funding. And Praj Foundation has supported us excellently. I mean, I just needed one phone call. No project reports, no project proposals, nothing of that kind. No limitations, no, uh, no demands. No accounting, nothing that she said, yes, the, this is the ma 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 money that we can give. Fortunately, it's not only a commercial kind of uh, association, but it works really for this. Those who know no Foundation must have known, the, must have seen their work in the pre previous uh, years. We, many individuals also offered us uh, some monetary help. We uh, did not need it, mainly one. Uh, after Praj gave us money, but even after that, we did not take it from anybody. If at all needed, we would take it. But I call, I got get a call yesterday night from Bapar's sisters, namely uh, Ms. Sunita Doshi and Vijaya Thawle, and they said that we want to do something. And uh, to them, I can't say, I couldn't say no. And they have given us a check just yes, now. I thank them very much for their kind gesture. Now, uh, let me just introduce uh, Sadanan Menon in brief. It's difficult to uh, introduce him he, 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 he in a brief. He, uh, this is his first uh, public lecture, I think, in uh, Pune. He has been here for different seminars, conferences. Uh, he has actually has spent his childhood here. From first standard to fifth standard, he was a student in Pune. So he's not in that sense. You, the, all the older people here might have seen, have seen him as a small child. But anyway, uh, I, in short, actually, he is a nationally reputed arts editor, popular teacher of cultural journalism, an excellent photographer himself, stage light designer, prolific speaker, at his seminars on politics, ecology, and the arts. I've been lucky to be with him on a number of seminars. I, I, in fact, G, GPD, him, and Professor Bapat, I at least I shared three seminars with them, and it was an enlightening experience. I'm very sure, sure it will be today also. He is a member of Apex Advisory Committee, National Museum, Delhi, Advisory Committee, National Gallery of Modern Art, Bangalore, Member Executive Council, Lalit Kala Academy, Delhi, Member Governing Council, Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Himla, a Managing Trustee Spaces and Arts Foundation, Chennai, a close associate of legendary choreographer Chandra Lekha. He is deeply involved with issues concerning contemporary Indian dance. In 19 
1998-99, he curated a major retrospective exhibition of 50 years for Dasharath Patel's work in paintings, ceramics, photography, and designing for NGMA, Delhi, and New, Mumbai, and, um, New Delhi and Mumbai. He recently delivered Sabdar Hashmi Memorial Lecture for Jananatya Manch, Delhi, and Habib Tanvir Memorial Lecture for Raza Foundation, Delhi. He was one of the very few journalists, art journalists inv invited to Norway for 150 years uh, celebration of the artist Munk. And he had written an excellent article in Hindu, uh, some of you might have read it. He'll be speaking on, this on the topic, visualizing identity, the cultural politics of Dravidian nationalism. Actually, Bapat's three main major concerns of Bapat were uh, society and politics and arts and literature. So we had requested, or, or we will be requesting all the future speakers to have, I mean, base their uh, subject on this tripod, Manu politics, society, and literature and arts. So this topic is extremely interesting in that, that aspect as well. He'll be discussing employment of cinema and other cultural planks for identity construction in the Dravidian movement and how, how over the years it has become an inclusion-exclusion device which is kept up at will for a political manipulation. We hope to get such eminent speakers in next three years or even after that. We, we do intend to continue that. And we would like your support as well as you have come here in large numbers. I'm quite certain that you will get extremely satisfied. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ya Vyakhyana Malachi Kalpana Susle Pasun. Ti Sampuruna Karyan with Karana Saticha Ayojan Niyojana Made. Jaja Sonstani Vektini Amala Pratiksha Kiwa a Pratikshrita Madat Kili. त्या सर्वांचे आभार मानायचे आहेत वेळेची मर्यादा लक्षात घेता सर्वांचा नामोल्लेख न करता प्रातिनिधिक स्वरूपात काही संस्था आणि व्यक्ती यांचा विशेषत्वाने उल्लेख करून आभार मानतो प्राच फाउंडेशन आणि त्याच्या संचालिका श्रीमती परिमल चौधरी बापट सरांच्या भगिनी श्रीमती सुनीता जोशी आणि विद्या आठवले साधना साप्ताहिक पाक्षिक परिवर्तनाचा वाट सुरू मासिक आंदोलन शाश्वत विकासासाठी सर्व मराठी आणि इंग्रजी वृत्तपत्र आणि वृत्तचित्र संपादक वार्ता प्रतिनिधी ऑल इंडिया रेडिओ पुणे स्टेशन एस एम जोशी सभागृहाचे व्यवस्थापक आणि सर्व कर्मचारी तसंच संजय दापके प्रदीप माळी वैभव आबनावे संदीप देशपांडे शैलेश परांजपे श्रीरंग गोडबोले अश्विनी परांजपे गौरी लागू आणि आपण सर्व उपस्थित बापट सर प्रेमी जन हो आपली महत्वपूर्ण उपस्थिती आपल्या सर्वांचं हे नितळ प्रेम या पुढच्या तीनही वर्षातल्या व्याख्यानांना लाभेल अशी नुसती आशा नाही तर खात्री बाळगतो आणि सर्वांना मनापासून धन्यवाद देतो मी आता सदानंद मेनन यांना विनंती करतो की त्यांनी आपले विचार मांडावेत त्यांच्या भाषणानंतर प्राध्यापक गोपू देशपांडे यांचं अध्यक्षीय भाषण होईल आणि त्यानंतर आजचा कार्यक्रम संपेल कार्यक्रमाचा रसभंग होऊ नये म्हणून एक नम्र आवाहन करतो कृपया आपले मोबाईल फोन बंद ठेवावेत आणि एक प्राध्यापक राम बापट यांचे लेख खंड दोन राज्य संस्था भांडवलशाही आणि पर्यावरणवाद हे लोकवाङ्मय ग्रह प्रकाशनतर्फे हे पुस्तक प्रकाशित झालेलं आहे मार्च महिन्यामध्ये हे बाहेर विक्रीसाठी उपलब्ध आहे आपण त्याचा लाभ घ्यावा धन्यवाद ह्याचा पहिला खंड पण बाहेर आहे विक्रीसाठी एकच मिनिटाचा अवधी घेतो हे आम्ही रेकॉर्डिंग करतो त्याचे पुस्तक काढण्याची इच्छा आहे हां हे व्याख्यानमाला सर्व आम्ही रेकॉर्डिंग करतो आहोत आणि ह्याचं पुढे पुस्तक काढायची पण आमची इच्छा आहे एक काही क्षणासाठी आम्ही इथली व्यवस्था थोडी बदलतो म्हणजे त्यांच्या या व्याख्यानाला ते सोयीचं जाईल एकच मिनिट आमच्याबरोबर
ਤੇ ਆਨ ਕਰ ਰਹੇ please don't get scared <laughs> big brother always watches uh, it's with some sense of uh, deep emotion that i stand here today like uh, makarand indicated with uh, professor ram bapat and uh, his bosom buddy used to call them twiddle them twiddle the uh, gopu uh, i've had the good fortune of having been in very many different fora through all sorts of ranges of uh, subjects and discussions in so many different corners of the country of course the big cities uh, mumbai and uh, chennai and delhi and so on but also in some very very interesting locations in bagaman in hegodu in uh, pune itself etc <coughs> and each time it was such a pleasure engaging with uh, bapat being witness to the sawal jawab that he and gopu could always generate uh learning from it the unsparing engagement with the life of the mind the unsparing exploration of ideas of a kind of honesty and truth that is is a very rare thing in in the intellectual life of uh, the average person and uh, often one goes to seminars and i'm sure there are many here who have attended many seminars and have also experienced a certain kind of a overarching feeling of hypocrisy in many of the things that are spoken where you open your lips and say things which probably you don't mean or you go only halfway with an idea and you're not willing to push it to an edge from where it becomes provocative it becomes explosive it you know begins to affect people and change people's lives so in that context the intimate contact with professor ramba put and his style of unsparingly engaging with ideas no matter what the subject no matter what the context no matter what the occasion uh, was something that was uh, a learning experience i can't claim to be his student but uh, i can certainly claim to have learned from him and i remember about a year and a half ago when i was here in pune for some other event <coughs> uh very graciously makrand sathe had driven me across to bapat's house already there were signs of systems failure but uh, 
we had a very long, very prolonged, uh, almost a two-hour conversation on a range of things. But then I was tremendously moved because he said, now we must go and have some coffee. And we all went out and he took us to a small shop, fairly close to his house, where they give South Indian filter coffee. <laughs> and he remembered to do that. And I think it was a very poignant moment. And uh, the next news one got of him was of his uh, departure. So of course, everybody departs. And uh, these are milestones in one's life. But, uh, I do remember that last afternoon with uh, Bapat Sahib very, very fondly. So I'm very grateful for <coughs> having been asked to come here for this event today. Memorials can always turn out to be conventional affairs, ritualistic, without any life in it, without any, you know, as Dorothy Parker used to say, everything about death is disgusting, but the most disgusting are the life, are the, are the graveside emotions of the living. And uh, sometimes memorials can get tormented and uh, corrupted by those kind of things. Uh, so, we need to constantly interrogate ourselves as to how do we remember those who are near, near and dear to us once they are gone. What will be a way of memorializing? Do we museumize them? Do we uh, put them on a shelf? Do we, uh, or do we do something by which the person lives continuously and for a longer time in her or his work. So this is a challenge. Uh, and since uh, uh, Makarand and group of friends, Gajanan and everybody are uh, intent to do this uh, on a continuous basis, at least for some time, it will also be a challenge to see how to keep it creative as one goes along and uh, not ossify it into a mechanical activity every year. And that, I'm sure, was, would be <clears throat> very much in keeping with the spirit of Babbitt, who simply could not be mechanized. He's, I don't think his one day was the same as the other. He, he constantly was renewing himself. So. <clears throat> I wasn't very sure what what the thank you. <laughs> That's a good reminder <laughs> that one shouldn't get too emotional. <laughs> There's always a bell in the vicinity. Uh, so I was a bit uh, hesitant about what to speak about on an occasion like this. Should it, be, should it be something connected to Bapat Sir's own life, his concerns, mm. and so on. So it, was, it wasn't very easy. And uh, eventually, at the very last moment, I threw a lifeline to GPD from Chennai saying, Sir, sir, please help. Uh, what, what could one speak about? <laughs> and GPD, having been I think tortured by me in listening to me in many other fora, he had a very good idea of what might be an appropriate subject to discuss here. And uh, that's how we came up with this idea of uh, looking at the cultural politics of the Dravidian movement. Uh, now the question really is, who, which are the movements that we can think of in the last hundred years which 
consciously, self-consciously, in a proclaimed way, engage with cultural politics. Politics we understand, but cultural politics, to work with people at a subconscious level, to work with people uh, at a level where you're not just uh, stating a line or you're not just proposing a political project that by doing so and so we will attain power uh, and this is our you know political manifesto but cultural politics which actually like Michel Foucault says enters your system like a capillary in, in a capillary way it, it, through every pore you absorb you absorb that ideology you absorb that concern you absorb that 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 sense of purpose uh, which the political movement wants to wants you to feel and uh, you will be surprised that there have been very very few moments in uh, global history in the last hundred years where such things have happened. Uh, one very transformative moment was when gender politics came up, when fem feminism came up, certainly. When the idea of the personal is political came up, yes, it was a major transformative moment and uh, one has seen the effects of it. But in otherwise the political sphere, the other moments when this kind of idea has manifested itself and successfully, they have unfortunately been negative moments. One of the most frightening, of course, was what happened in Nazi Germany, where they understood culture, they understood cultural work, if you have to call it that. It is quite surprising that uh, while the idea of cultural politics comes from the left, comes from the socialist movements, comes from thinkers like, say, Walter Benjamin, or even before that from people like Trotsky, and so many others down the line, Jonah Karski and Plekhanov and so on. But eventually it finds its grounding, it, it finds its soil, in something that is manipulative, something that uh, in fact transforms its subjects into unconscious actors who uh, reflect or bring out the worst in themselves. So it's like being in a state of amnesia and doing things because there is a call, it's an interpolated call from somewhere. There's a call for you to belong to that particular cause. And the call speaks through you, and you can't reject that call, and so on. Uh, and this was something that Walter Benjamin warned us about when he said that uh, uh, to work with culture would mean the need to transform politics. So it is not culturalizing politics, but it is politicizing culture. And that is a very important distinction and something that we need to think about. Uh, so some of these thoughts were in my mind uh, when I graduated from uh, the Madras Christian, I did my post-graduation in Madras Christian College and the very second, the, the very next day after my final exam, I walked into the office of the Indian Express newspaper in Madras those days, now it's called Chennai, because I was convinced I wanted to be a journalist. And I walked up to the news editor, very well-known gentleman, a uh, very charismatic gentleman that time, C.P. Seshadri. Everybody called him master. And I said, I've finished my uh, exam. I don't know whether I'll pass or fail, but I now want to be a journalist. And is there a vacancy available here? Now, he was a man of few words, master. So, And he was, uh, he, his mouth used to be full of pan. 
and was constantly like, oh. So that was why he was a man of few words. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd get a spray. Uh, so he was carrying a sheaf of uh, uh, what are called teleprinter takes. Today's media world doesn't have any of that. Today, uh, you go directly onto the computer, on the internet, you do your stuff. You go onto a Word file or whatever. But those days, there used to be PTI teleprinters, UNI teleprinters, and other AFP teleprinters. And these teleprinters would constantly be giving what are called feeds. So reams upon reams of paper would come out as people were sending messages from here and there, news reports from everywhere. He was carrying a sheaf of them in his hand at that moment, and he thrust it into my hand, and he said, oh, go, edit. So I took it and sat on a table, and I started looking at it. Now, the interesting report it, from Chennai itself, from Madras itself, it was a survey conducted by the Madras Blood Bank. The Madras General Hospital, which is one of the Asia's big, biggest hospitals, has a blood bank. And the blood bank had found a very interesting uh, fluctuation in the way people donated blood in the city of Madras. They found that on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, virtually there were no donors. Then Tuesday started going a bit, Wednesday a little bit, Thursday it started going up. Friday, it would, the graph would hit the ceiling. And then Saturday, it would drop to zero again. And this completely puzzled them because uh, they were, of course, in need of blood on a regular basis. And this pattern kind of disturbed them. So they invited the Madras School of Social Work. Those days, it was a fairly well-known institution. Now it's kind of collapsed a bit. But the Madras School of Social Work was appointed to do a survey to find out why this fluctuation existed. And the, what I had been asked to edit that morning was the report that had been submitted by the Madras School of Social Work. And the report said that the average person who came to the Madras blood bank to donate blood was donating blood in order to receive back. For every pint of blood, you got five rupees compensation. So on Fridays, you donated blood, got five rupees, to go and then stand in a queue to see the Friday release of M.G. Ramachandran's new film. <laughs> this sounds funny, no? <laughs> but you just think a little deeply and you realize the grimness of the whole thing. Here are people who probably haven't had a meal that day, but they have stood in a queue there were long queues for blood donation on Fridays. They stood in a queue, they donated blood, they collected the composition. Then they go and stand in another long queue to buy that front row seats uh, for the new MGR release. And then Saturday, of course, <laughs> they're exhausted, so nobody goes to see a movie, so no blood donation. And Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, nothing happens, and Wednesday, it starts picking up. So this pattern was the, so. And this was the first copy that I had to edit. And I still remember giving a headline for it, movies are in their blood. <laughs> and, of course, I got the job instantly. <laughs> and uh, from that point, uh, my interest in this phenomena got aroused. I mean, uh, it had really got triggered up. What is this happening? Why is it that someone is actually Taking cinema in such a visceral way, you know, where your body is getting into it, your blood is getting into it, that you are willing to donate blood for uh, a movie star. And then I started hearing, so I, the more I tracked it, I had been, I, I was new to uh, Chennai, meaning I had done my schooling in various parts of India and come to Chennai only for my college. And when I hadn't paid much attention to the whole, you know, when, when, I, when I reached Chennai, in 1968, the DMK had just come to power. 1967, they had just come to power. That was the culmination of uh, uh, 40 years of the Dravidian movement. For the first time, the DMK had come to power. And uh, of course, uh, we all speak very lovingly about 
the 34 years of uh, continuous rule by the left front in West Bengal, which is a big record. But nobody speaks about now the 46 years of continuous rule by Dravidian parties in Tamil Nadu, of which 20 years by the DMK and the other 26 years, actually 25 years by the Anna DMK, the uh, party started by M.G. Ramachandran. Uh, somehow that is not talked about, which is very interesting. There was a, one year there was a president's rule imposed during the emergency, but otherwise uh, it's been a steady, unbroken, Dravidian rule in that state with the Congress standing no chance and no other party standing a chance, including the BJP, thank God, and so on. <laughs> but I'm saying thank God too fast, so uh, we'll, we'll come to it as we go along. Uh, so, one had, the, 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 the party had uh, come to power, and the very next year, 1969, its first chief minister, the very highly celebrated uh, leader, speaker, orator, writer, C. N. Anadure, had passed away. And uh, there was a fun funeral procession, which I remember attending, meaning uh, there was no other go if you were in a traveling to college in the bus. Uh, all the buses were stopped on the way, and uh, we had to walk. For two full days, uh, everything was shut down in, 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 in Tamil Nadu. And uh, the funeral procession of uh, CN Anadure had a very interesting character. As the funeral cottage passed down the main street, the Mount Road of Madras, which is now called Annasali, <coughs> There was a, a, a procession of over 1,000 plus women who had opened their hair and they were mourning, it's called an opari, they were mourning as if their own husband had died. And this was the kind of, um, of course millions of people, but this was the most dramatic sight in that. And so, so I, rem I had remembered it, but uh, it hadn't, I was still very young, it, it hadn't kind of, you know, registered much. But after this incident in the newspaper office and uh, suddenly realizing that people are, you know, giving blood to just go and watch an ordinary movie, uh, something began to work in my mind. And from that time, I became very alert to these signals. Where are these signals coming from and what is this whole thing about? and what is the Dravidian movement all about, and so on. So uh, it's been a journey, uh, uh, kind of trying to understand it from then on. Mm. Uh, of course, uh, very soon uh, my own political formations uh, happened, and uh, I was firmly on the left flank, and one began to analyze all these kind of nationalisms or sub-nationalisms, as a, uh, how do you say, as, as reactionary almost. Uh, I wouldn't say that now, but at that time, this was the, <laughs> this, this was the position. And uh, uh, so one looked at all this with, 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 a, with a certain suspicion, as if uh, this is not me, this is somebody else. But as one began to, figure out where this whole thing was coming from and where it was going, uh, many interesting uh, revelations happened. I mean, there were revelations to me, and uh, I'm speaking about it now. I've written about it extensively in many places, but uh, uh, I've never put together uh, a kind of a slideshow of my own visuals. All these are my photographs. You'll see about 35 of them. I have a bank of about 400 pictures of the Dravidian story, if you want. There's about 35 I've brought for this evening. Uh, so the, the question, I mean, if I, to, if I have to begin from today. So I'm saying there have been 46 years of continuous Dravidian rule in this one state. If you take a state of Tamil Nadu report today and study it, what you will see in that are some rather horrendous figures. 
with respect to human rights violations, with respect to food scarcities, with respect to uh, rural migrations into urban areas, with respect to uh, destroyed agriculture, with respect to police atrocities, and worst of all, with respect to the caste balance. And all of you have read in the last one week the report of uh, the Dalit boy and the one-year girl who were in love and eloped and got married and the consequences that followed. Where the rule of law stays aside and the law of the street takes over. The, the, the cup panchayats, they are called the katta panchayats. panchayats. So the katta panchayat comes into the picture and it begins to determine how you should lead your life, whom you should meet, how you should uh, love, how you should marry, and so on and so forth. Even today, there are many, many Dalit uh, villages and areas hardly 60 kilometers away from Chennai, almost one can say, <clears throat> where a Dalit boy on a bicycle, as he's cycling through the so-called caste area, or the caste part of the village, will have to dismount from the bicycle. If he's got his sleeves rolled up, he'll have to unfold the sleeves. If he's wearing chappals, he'll have to take it and hold it in his hand and walk by. <clears throat> Still continues. In a state, <clears throat> which has claims to 46 years at least of governance and which came into power after another almost 30-35 years of agitation for social justice. And where <clears throat> sorry, every leader can spout the name of uh, Yoti Das, Ramaswamy Nayakar, uh, Jivanandam, uh, Ambedkar, Jyoti Bafule, they can all speak from platforms. And yet, this social equalizing hasn't happened. The social justice movement somewhere has fallen short. So, uh, the current situation in Tamil Nadu, therefore, is of a very, very peculiar order. It's a very violent society. It's a very confrontational society. And the battles are no longer between uh, the community that was originally attacked and demonized when the Dravidian movement began. Uh, somewhere around, if you want to put a date to it, one can sharply say it was 1916. That is when a party called the Justice Party came up. And the Justice Party, there was a, there was a history of at least another 70 years before, from 1951 onwards, when this apprehension that uh, Indian nationalism, post the first war of independence, the, this idea of Indian nationalism had come, come in. And uh, meanwhile, the East India Company had been pushed out and the crown had taken over. But the idea of nationalism had got embedded. And that India would become independent at some point had got embedded. And for the non-Brahmin communities and castes, this was a worrying prospect because they were convinced that Indian freedom can only be a freedom for the Brahmin <coughs> and extreme oppression for the non-Brahmin. So a series of, uh, how do you say, uh, projects happened almost, if you want to say, uh, a series of organizations sprung up of uh, elites from the middle castes. These are the Modaliyars, the Vanyars, the Nadars, the uh, Gounders, and Naidus, and Chettiars, and of course, we are talking about the Madras presidency of that time, so there were people from Andhra region, there were people from Kerala region, there were people from Karnataka region. So there were the Naidus, and there were the Nayars, and there were the Nambiars, and the, and they were fairly well off. They were landed people. 
many of them had gone by the, by the turn of the century, around the early part of the 20th century, 1919 <coughs> to 1905, that period, a large number of them had returned to to the Madras presidency, having studied and graduated from Oxford and Cambridge and here and there. And they were lawyers, they were doctors, they were very articulate, and they were wealthy. And they were determined that the idea of Indian freedom cannot be the freedom of the Brahmin. It has to be the freedom of a co more, the common wheel, as we say. And uh, this was already a project. So while Indian nationalism was slowly building up, uh, and around the time of uh, 1916, when uh, uh, you know uh, Annie Besant's Home Rule League had already sprung up, and had already proposed that uh, the British should be uh, curbing their administrative powers and giving more and more powers to local legislators. The groups of non-Brahmin associations were very strongly campaigning in all sorts of ways, uh, challenging this, calling Annie Besant an Irish Brahmani, <laughs> and so on and so forth, and saying that th this is a, uh, a project meant to enslave the non-Brahmin even more. And very, very clearly enunciating the Justice Party Manifesto, which was written in the year 1916, 17, enunciates that we support British rule in India because it is they who can deliver justice to us and not any other government that would be under a Brahmin rule. And uh, some of these ideas were nebulous at that point, but from 1916 onwards, this slowly gains momentum. And uh, by the time you're entering the 1930s, already a huge amount of, you know, uh, sophistication has come to this argument. And very convincing sophistication. Uh, a writer like uh, Yoti Das, uh, a Dalit writer. Well, Dalits in Tamil Nadu are actually called Adi Dravidas. They call themselves Adi Dravidas. Uh, somewhat like Fule's construction of the Atishudrata, Atishudra idea. Uh, uh, they were extremely uh, clear, Yoti Das particularly was extremely clear that uh, the construction of identity for uh, the Paraya community that he represented, or he, he spoke for, could only come from a different religious source. And he was very convinced that almost all uh, citadels of Brahminical dominance in Tamil Nadu at that point, which obviously were represented by temples, were in fact Buddhist shrines at some point, and had been usurped and absorbed into the Brahminical discourse. And for him, it was very clear that uh, recapture of that was important, because that was the only religion that, Buddhism was the only religion that gave you uh, freedom from that sort of uh, cast iron framework. Uh, and then came E.V. Ramaswamy Nayakar, uh, who was in fact in the Congress party earlier, but in 1924, when the Vaikom Satyagraha was going on for temple entry in the Vaikom temple, it was uh, Mahatma Gandhi who sends him to Vaikom to say, now you organize that struggle and see to it that Harijans get entry into the temple. And uh, he is otherwise also called Vaikom Viran, the, the Veer who returned victorious from Baikam because he succeeds in the struggle. The temple doors are thrown open. The Maharaja has to step down. Uh, and uh, the Dalit lawyer who had first demanded the right to step into the temple is ceremoniously sent into the temple and so on. When he returns, the Justice Party, which is looking for uh, some sort of leadership at that time, it's floundering, uh, finds in Ramaswami Nayakar uh, possible candidate for leading them. 
he's personally very hesitant. But then he hears of a uh, particularly disgusting custom in in a in a gurukula in uh, sorry not a gurukula it's a patashala in uh, uh, in Madurai where they practice what is called commensal segregation where uh, the Brahmins eat in one area with one set of uh, plates and uh, glasses and tumblers and so on and uh, the non-Brahmins are segregated and given a difference so the tumblers and the plates can't mix and so on and so forth. Uh, and he went there and he sort of tried to repeat a Vaikam kind of an agitation there and received no support from the Congress uh, ministers at that time, Satya Murthy, Rajagopal Achari, etc. They were simply not for this. They, they, they wanted that caste identity to be preserved. So he appealed to the central leadership, to Gandhi, Nehru, etc. and didn't receive any response. And in total disgust, he gets out of the Congress party and joins the Justice Party and takes over the leadership. And um, the Justice Party, meanwhile, has uh, already in support of the British, uh, uh, started practicing the diarchy system of administration, where all other presidencies rejected the British idea of uh, double governance. But in Madras presidency alone, the Justice Party agrees to do this. They stand for elections. They've been hands down. And they practice this diarchy. <coughs> but uh, uh, Ramaswamy Nayakar, as he works with the Justice Party, he begins to discover that actually this entire non-Brahmin movement, as it was being called at that time, was working for the elite among the non-Brahmin. And it wasn't still speaking to the subaltern. It wasn't still speaking to the, the, the Dalit community. And the the first stone was struck in 1921 when a very, very important Dalit leader called M.C. Raja, who until then was with the Justice Party, splits. He moves out of the Madras Assembly, carrying all his followers with him, accusing the justice leadership of uh, uh, practicing a privileged politics and uh, not uh, looking after the interests of uh, uh, the, the more dispossessed among the among the, uh, the the constituency and uh, this of course uh, is something that uh, Ramaswamy Nayakar also sees but meanwhile he has also found out that it's not enough to preach political ideas so around that time 1917 is also the russian revolution and uh, Ramaswamy Nayakar very interestingly has got influenced by Lenin, of all people, and he has read voraciously, and he has uh, met people who have come from Russia. And then a little, little, little later, somewhere in the late 20s, he also travels to Russia, and he comes back with a, I mean, he begins to call himself a Bolshevik, and uh, he comes with those ideas. And when eventually the non-Brahmin manifesto is written, uh, it has some extremely progressive ideas, at least uh, 18 of the 24 ideas in the non brahmin manifesto are from the Communist Manifesto. But the new ones that are added are even more interesting. For example, there is one clause that is added which is complete support to scientific ideas and rationality and rejection of any superstitious uh, ideology. A total unequivocal position on women's liberation. It's not there in the Communist Manifesto, but it's here, <laughs> the uh, Dravidian Manifesto. So these kind of extremely progressive ideas are included in this, and uh, the uh, caravan moves on. Uh, but Ramaswamy Nagar finds that in order to actualize all these things, using the political platform is no longer sufficient because he finds that political ideas and political ideology are not reaching out, they are not touching people. It's just become speeches from stages. So he then formulates this idea for himself that nothing can change 
particularly among the community he's addressing, the, the, the uh, lower rung of the non-Brahmins, the Parayas, the Dalits, and so on, nothing can change unless and until they learn self-respect. They practice self-respect. And from this point on, Ramaswamy Nayakar's politics takes a very, very different turn. He, he gets out of the Justice Party, and he, he creates what is called the self-respect movement. And all his followers in historical writing have been called self-respecters. Uh, but they had three flanks. And they were very interesting. Uh, one was self-respect, individual self-respect. Number two was, that is called Suya Mariyadai in Tamar. Number two is Samadharmam or Socialism. Very important. Self-respect can go together only with Socialism. And number three, Suyachi, meaning self-governance. We will not let somebody else govern us. We have to govern ourselves. And it was to propagate this that in the early 30s, uh, Ramaswam Nayakar sets out, and he knows that it cannot be done through speeches. Of course, he's a, one of the most, uh, uh, one can only call, outstanding journalist of his times, as was Mahatma Gandhi and so on, and uh, as was Tilak at one point. I mean, this is extraordinary, the kind of time they found to edit and constantly write in not one magazine and one journal, but half a dozen, one dozen, and so all kind of different things. So, uh, uh, Ramaswamy himself started at least uh, seven uh, weeklies and monthlies, and one daily, uh, and was constantly writing in them and constantly pub getting published. And uh, uh, the other, uh, but but he found that these are these are realms of literacy. You can write in the newspaper, but if 90% uh, of your uh, constituency can't read, then that, that doesn't help. So then he devised a way of how to make them come to these ideas. And from there on begins this notion of a cultural intervention. Uh, so the first set of ideas he propounded was uh, Going with one of his, say, Vidudale, Vidudale means freedom. That was one of his very important uh, newspapers. So that morning's Vidudale would, by about 4.30 in the evening, a volunteer of the self-respect movement would go with it to an area. It could be some chowk, it could be uh, a, a bus, bus shelter, it could be the beach. You would take it with you. Accompanying you will be one person holding a lantern and another person having a drum. Then where you go, you start, the person bit starts beating the drum. So as uh, the, uh, I mean, Indian experience is anybody beats a drum, immediately 200 people come around. So, so that would happen. Uh, it's like a madari ka khel. Uh, then this person will start reading aloud the headlines of the paper, the main, main stories in the paper, and so on, the main analysis, the editorial. And as he is reading aloud, he will also start explaining. This is what is meant, because they are very clear that uh, the written language and the spoken language are different in Tamar, so they did not want any confusion to happen. So this would go on. Then slowly, as it started getting dark, the lantern would come up. The person holding the lantern would be standing. Uh, this kind of thing, can you imagine this happening in thousands, literally thousands of places across the state? Uh, voluntary activity, it's not a political, these are people who are not doing politics to come to power, to stand in election and come to power. They are renouncing that idea. They're saying this politics is not working. It is a kind of a transformation of the consciousness that is going to work. And they set out on this journey. Uh, after about a few years, these newspaper reading groups got also, as more and more volunteers came, they got converted into chorus groups. They would start singing songs. What kind of songs? Songs that would ridicule, uh, you know, the, the, the upper caste communities, the songs that would ridicule gods and goddesses, 
uh, and so on. So uh, much further uh, towards the 1950s, Ramaswamy Naikar also writes uh, a reply to Ramayana. He writes something called the Kimayana. Kima, I mean, this is, it literally means that. And he makes a Kima out of Rama and uh, Lakshmana. And uh, Ravana is pr promoted at this, as this fantastic Dravidian hero who has been wronged and who has been demonized and uh, who has been misrepresented throughout history. Uh, interestingly, there were no riots at that time. I mean, <laughs> people, people listened and they, they, they kind of tried to figure out the value of what somebody was saying. Uh, he had he mock processions of, uh, and this is very common in temple towns like Madras, for example, is a temple town. There is a Mailapur temple, there is a Triplican temple. And periodically there are temple processions around the uh, temple with the gods who are taken out, with some murtis are taken out and all that. So in imitation of that, he would take out mock processions with all the baja bajana along with it. but the gods would be garlanded with chapels uh, or would be garlanded with idlis and vada. And they would say, like, if this god can't supply food, idli, vada, to the masses, then what kind of a god is this? And so on. So uh, basically being irreverent, being uh, provocative, and often, and this is the best part of it, often being obscene to the limit. Uh, I've heard uh, in, the, in the late 60s, I've heard a E.V.R. Ram, Ramswami public meeting on Marina Beach, where, <laughs> and I, I, later on I heard that he was, this was a standard thing he practiced for 40 years. What has the Congress given to you? And the Vengayam, Vengayam means onions. Vengayam, but it also means balls. So, what has the Congress given to you? Balls. You know? And this, this was the language. And people used to get, of course, very offended. I mean, what is this? He's debasing the political language. How can you use catalogical references? How can you use vulgar you know, language? But this is being deliberately used by a highly erudite person, a very, very learned man who's extremely uh, conversant in many languages and so on. He could speak all the four southern languages. Uh, but it's a strategy, a strategy of uh, challenge, a strategy of thumbing your nose, a strategy of saying if you have your aesthetics and if you have your fineries, you keep it. We'll have something else. We'll create a new society, we'll create a new world, etc., etc. So uh, this was a... <coughs> Uh, kind of a process that happened until the year 1944, when finally uh, E.V. Ramaswamy Naikar decides that now uh, the period of uh, not being in politics can be, uh, can be, one can step back from that and get a little more into aggressive political mobilization. And that's when he uh, converts the self-respect movement into the DK or the Dravida Karagam or the Dravida Party. And that is the beginning of the uh, Dravidian party system as we know it today. The DK uh, immediately attracts the fact that he's, it seems like now he wants to engage with day-to-day -day politics immediately attracts a large number of young people. Uh, primarily among them, of course, these well-known names like C. N. Anadurai, who became the first chief minister of a very uh, charismatic professor in a college, but also an extremely powerful writer and orator. Very well read, very erudite. Uh, it attracts someone like uh, M. Karunanidhi, again a future chief minister, who electric with his uh, writing is, I mean, again, I would call him one of the finest journalists of her time. Brilliant uh, writing skills, brilliant. Pressy, you know, he, he could condense something, an extremely complex, long idea into a just set of three, four sentences, and knew how to communicate it with, with, with his audiences, and so on. A large number of young people gathered, Nadunjerian, and so on, uh, and uh, there, there, there was a, uh, the, the, a kind of a reference to this in uh, a book written by. Murasoli Maran, Karnanadi's nephew, who is no more, uh, 
he wrote a book called Manila Suyachi or uh, Political Self Determination, which is what the DMK and the DK were fighting for, in which he says that there was a time uh, in the Dravida Karagam hierarchy when number one to number 100 could all speak from a public platform for six hours non stop. <laughs> you must thank your stars that I have not trained in that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so oratory became a extremely, uh, what do you call, you know, well-used method to uh, reach out to the masses. Once again, we are talking of a context where during during the 1940s and 50s, the Milna literacy rates were at hardly 30 percent uh, or less. And uh, it was slightly above the national average at that time, but that, that was about it. Unlike in Kerala, which was already above 60% at that time. So, uh, oratory became an extremely important vehicle. Uh, song became a very uh, important and a useful vehicle. And then, around the mid-1944 is when the Dravid party is starting, around 1945-46, uh, as the movement gathers steam, it begins to attract what, uh, in a more, let's say, categorical sense, one would call the regional bourgeoisie. So there is a national bourgeoisie, the Tatas, Birlas, who are at that time very active, the Dalmias and so on, and they are supporting the national movement. Uh, Birlas are fully fund rolling uh, uh, the uh, uh, Gandhi's uh, expenses. Uh, somewhat like what Parimal did here. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry to go from sublime to ridiculous. <laughs> uh, but uh, the regional bourgeoisie has been keeping quiet, and suddenly they realize that there is a percentage in nationalism, that nationalism delivers back profits. And uh, yeah, seriously. So. A set of people emerge who, who are like money bags. They come and say, they, they tell the leadership, here we are, we have, we have the money, what should we do now? Uh, do you want an auditorium to speak from? And what do you want? We have the money. And another uh, uh, being the kind of shrewd politician he was, uh, realizes that this is the moment when uh, and since the DMK, uh, the, the DK, sorry, is already a, a party which is claiming to stand for science and technology and rationality, they move away from the traditional art forms until, of that time of song and uh, theater and uh, uh, oratory and so on, and quickly climb onto the cinema bandwagon. And they said, this is the method. Uh, cinema is light. Light is truth. Lenin. <laughs> Len Lenin. Electricity is truth. Uh, and uh, I mean, seriously, they were very well read in this whole thing. And this can be a medium to reach a vast number of people. No longer our small meetings with, uh, you know, 200, 300. We can now, you know, multiply it much more. So the, uh, the money bags are asked to invest in cinema in several flanks. Some were to build, some were to be exhibitors, build theaters. Some were to build studios. Some were to produce cinema. Uh, and some were to just support the kind of uh, infrastructure, the software you'll need for it, the writers and so on and so forth. Starting from 1945 uh, till 2001, Tamil Nadu had the largest number of exhibition, theater exhibition spaces anywhere in this country. Only in 2001, Andhra Pradesh went ahead by another 100 theaters or so. But until then, Tamil Nadu region, the Tamil region, and of course, if you put together at that time, it was still the pre-independence, still the Madras province. The enormous number of exhibition spaces, the, the Pakka theatres, and the touring theatres, and the uh, temporary shed theatres, and so on. 
Uh, I mean, even even now the number is about 2,800 or so. And uh, I mean, if you take UP or Bihar or Maharashtra or uh, Gujarat, and there's no comparison. No, it's, it's <laughs> far behind all. And this head start was given by the regional bourgeoisie who invested in cinema. And then the leaders of the party were very quick to begin to think of how to provide the software for it, how to write the scripts, what kind of messages will we give them. Uh, and uh, in no time, both Annadura and Karnanadi became some of the best script writers uh, of, uh, of Tamar cinema. And in fact, uh, just two years ago, another, uh, sorry, Karnanidhi celebrated his 100th script. He's written 100 film scripts. <coughs> now, E.V. Ramaswamy is encouraging all this. He has started the Dravid Karagam party, and he's seeing these young proteges that he has produced suddenly moving ahead at rapid pace, and he's very happy and is encouraging this. Uh, but he, uh, had a human frailty, uh, many men, it's a male frailty, uh, and uh, at the age of 69, he wanted to marry a 30-year-old girl, and uh, this became the chance for the young leaders, the young uh, Turks within the Travid Karagam to say, enough of this old man, let's move on. So they dump the DK and they form the new party, DMK, Dravida Munnetra Karagam, the Dravidian party that is forward-looking. And uh, <clears throat> almost immediately, on the 1949 is when this happens, and the very same year, Annadurai's major script called uh, Velekari, or the domestic help, uh, comes out, it hits the screens, is a big success, and these people know that their job is cut out. Two years later, you have the biggest blockbuster of those times, something called Parashakti. Uh, Parashakti is the name of uh, Devi, it's, uh, Shakti, <coughs> but it's a two and a half hour long diatribe written by Karnanidhi in the sharpest possible language, which is a severe critique of temples, priests, worship, gods, Brahminism, uh, northern culture, uh, <laughs> Aryan civilization and so on unrelenting so and they found for it a new actor who until then was known only on stage somebody called who later came to be called shivaji ganeshan uh, bharat ratna and so on uh, who the, there are long stretches in the film 20 minute stretches where all he's doing is looking into the camera and just declaiming and the entire thing is a torrent of words coming from karnanidhi's pen and it became a super, super hit. Even today, whenever Parashakti is revived, uh, the auditoriums are full, and uh, within the fifth minute, you can hear sounds of coin, ding, ding, ding. People are throwing coins, you know. <laughs> They're so happy with those dialogues. So th that was the fascination with this whole thing, and the, 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 how do you say, speed with which the whole thing entered Tamar society. And, uh, very quickly, they realized that this was a, a vehicle that they could really ride on and, and milk. And uh, again, unfortunately, even though Shivaji Ganeshan mouthed all these extremely iconoclastic ideas about God and temple and priest and everything in the film, he went and got married in Tirupati. So the party could not, of course, handle this. So the only thing they could do was to take him out of the party. And now they were looking for another face, another dummy, let's say, to carry the ideology of the party. And uh, very soon they found it in this uh, middle-aged, at that time middle-aged uh, actor who had already been in films since 1936, M.G. Ramachandran. Mm, and he was given some, uh, some of the most important scripts written by both Anadure and Karna, Karnanidhi. And uh, from that point on, 1954, he made the film called Malai Kallan. Malai Kallan means the mountain brigand. 
uh, up till uh, 1967, of course, they come to power. Uh, 1973, uh, MGR splits from the DMK party and creates the ADMK party or AIADMK as it's called now, All India, All India Anna DMK. Uh, MGR acts in 38 what are called Thravidian films. And these, these films are a mine of information to understand how one can work with technology, uh, um, semiotics, uh, with uh, uh, absolutely minimum resources, and create a propaganda machine that really took the party on a wave and brought them to power. So uh, this, is, this was like it became eventually the study that I was, I was doing. And of course, I'm not the only one who's done it. There have been very, very important scholars who have worked on this, uh, Theodore Bhaskaran and MSS Pandian and V. Uh, Gita and S. V. Rajadure and uh, Ravi Vasudevan and a lot of people have worked on this. Mm, so film studies is now you know, squarely gripped with this idea of the way film was used. Now, this is very different from the way Goebbels used cinema. The way Goebbels got Lenny Reifenstahl to manufacture fascism, or you know, uh, what, what, what she called fascinating fascism, and so on. Uh, that, is, that is a different thing. Here, it's a very strong narrative uh, methodology, where a particular uh, scenario opens out before you when you see it. So for example, when the DMK party was formed, of course from the DK time onwards, they still believed that parliamentary democracy in India would be Brahmin Raj. And they didn't want to be, have anything of it. So 1944 to 1949 is the DK party's era. 1949, that's just two years after independence, the DMK has come to power. I mean, not power, sorry, has been formed. But the DMK is also saying, no, no, the parliament is untouchable. We don't want to go there. We don't want to have anything to do with this parliamentary democracy. We will do our own stuff. So they become an extra parliamentary force. And how do they prove it? By burning the constitution every day. One copy of the constitution is burnt every day somewhere in Tamil Nadu, <laughs> ceremoniously, without, no, no police could touch them because they would do it in such a clever way. But they would do that. see to it that the world knew that we are burning the constitution. So they were a non-parliamentary party in that sense. Eventually, uh, they are persuaded to stand for election very half-heartedly in the year, I think the 1955 elections or so. And uh, they do very half-heartedly participate, but they know their heart is not in it. So now if you take the films, the Dravidian films made, period from the time MGR comes, 1954, up till 1962. There's six plus two, eight years. Eight years of about, uh, for I think roughly about 12 films that were made by the Dravidian party, by the DMK. Every one of these films has a f interesting title. It's this kind of thing, Nadodi Mannan, the, the king who ran away. Uh, or uh, Malai Kallan, or the you know, mountain brigand, or Marma Yogi, and so on, uh, which indicate, if you are reading, and, and uh, as all the followers read it, that the true rulers have been outlawed. They are somewhere in the mountain. They are like Robin Hood. The usurpers are ruling and they are the tyrants. We need to take these tyrants out. So every film came with this package of information that those who are ruling are illegitimate. We who have been outlawed and are in the hills are the legitimate uh, heirs to the throne and we should be brought in. Dramatic, from 54 to 1962, this is the story of the Dravidian films. 1962, a major event happens, Indochina War. The government of India decides that this is the time to teach these guys a le lesson. So Nehru catches all of them and puts them in jail. So all the number one to number 40 of the DMK hierarchy is in jail. 
and under the defense of those days it was the defense of india rules no me service other now it's, that time there was only the defense of india rules and that's good enough huh? even today <laughs> under defense of india rules if you go in tata bye bye uh, they are given a suggestion that we can release you quickly i mean nobody knew how long this war would go on eventually the war lasted only a few days but uh, they are given the thing, the, the option that we can release you provided you sign on this bond that from henceforth you will be a parliamentary party you will contest elections and after three days of persuasion we still don't know there's no history that tells us what kind of persuasion it was but after three days of persuasion they came out and from that point on they became a parliamentary party of course the war finished and people were preparing for the next election 1962 to 1967 they come to power in 1967 five years in those five years there are 11 films made each of them addressing the constituency because now we are coming to the parliamentary game so the actor mgr then becomes padagoti or the catamaran fisherman the traditional fisherman or he becomes vivasai or the peasant or he becomes tholilali or the factory worker uh, or he becomes engavita pillai meaning you know the child of your house and he acts as a teacher in that a school teacher and uh, he becomes a rickshaw karan and he becomes a, uh, you know he just addresses every single subaltern uh, constituency that is there to address through the cinema by becoming a hero who plays that particular role he is a peasant he is a worker he is a school teacher he is a uh, cycle rickshaw puller and so on and so forth 1967 they come to power 67 to 73 six years before mgr splits from that and moves on in those six years the six or seven still dravidian films that are being made mgr becomes the representative of the state he becomes a good policeman a good bureaucrat a good politician <laughs> <laughs> so this is a fantastic trick played by that cinema and uh, uh it's it's the um post 1973 mgr made uh, a few films i think for the next two years he made some films where he appeals to his audiences uh, and by that time his fan clubs have grown by the time uh, mgr is starting his own party he has a fan club base of base of over 100000 people uh, there are 18000 fan clubs at that time today of course someone like rajnikanth has over 44000 fan clubs but uh, those days 18000 was a big number and uh, he addresses the fan clubs uh, and his audiences um, uh, promising to give good governance so the three or four films he made post starting the party uh, were, 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 were of that kind where he's promising uh, a good time so this very very uh, interesting manipulation of uh, the cultural form Uh, of uh, a new technology and of a extremely uh, clever use of for example color the red and black was a party color and uh, they were uh, very sure that the, when the hero appeared on the screen he would have a red shirt and a black pant uh, and a black cap and a red feather and you know all the variations possible and when he's normally addressed A, a political speech and everybody understood every child in tamil nadu under, understands when what is called katchi pechi comes katchi is party and pechi is speech so when the party talk comes everybody gets very agog <laughs> because that's where the ideology is being delivered and when that is happening it happens as the sun rises behind you you know the rising sun that that's a symbol of the party and so on. very very cleverly used and constantly you know every nuance of this has been manipulated and milked uh, and so on so i'll quickly take you through some of the visuals which may give you an idea of exactly what was happening there so this is of course our grand uh, uh, figure of the dravidian movement e v ramaswami nayakar 
And this is another method that the Dravidian parties invented, the giant political cutouts. And uh, this one, <laughs> it's a 12-story building, so this is a <laughs> taller than a 12-story building. And it's truly, historically, really a gigantic figure. I think he deserves all the size that he gets. <laughs> this is his Chela, C. N. Annadurai, who became the chief, first chief minister of the Davidian movement. Uh, unfortunately, died at the age of uh, 61 or so. Uh, There you have on the right Karunanidhi, who at that time was in alliance with Rajiv Gandhi in Mopanar, the Congress. These three cutouts, by the way, are in the campus of one of the oldest colleges in, the, in South India, Queen Mary's College. And the, camp, the college authorities couldn't do a thing about it. When they said, you're planting the cutouts there, they had to just give in. <laughs> That, of course, is our hero, MGR, dominating the skyline in many places in Chennai for a long time. He continuously ruled for 11 years. He was chief minister. That uh, little dark statue you see below is the statue of one of the most famous poets in Tamil language, Avayar. And, uh, you have an even bigger poet next to it. <laughs> That's, of course, our current chief minister, towering above everything. Now, this was that first phase of the Dravidian cinema that I was talking about, where the idea of nationalism is constantly being questioned. So. I'm sure many of you are, uh, are, are familiar with this, that uh, when the debates on Indian nationalism happened, there were all sorts of debates. And uh, from, from the idea of uh, uh, Gandhi's idea of nationalism to Nehru's idea of nationalism to Ambedkar's idea of nationalism to Tagore's idea of nat nationalism uh, to Ramaswamy Nayakar's idea of nationalism, there were many, many nationalisms being proposed. So there was an idea of a Dalit Sthan at some point. There was an idea of uh, the, the uh, Dravidian parties were fighting for a Dravid Sthan. And it's the residue of that you find in the Elam struggle in Sri Lanka. The need for a separate Tamil space, a separate Tamil land. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the ideology has stayed for a long time. Now, Tagore, for example, was fascinating. He said, uh, a nation need not be just, uh, he said there are two kinds of nationalities. One, one can be Mrindmaya and one can be Chinmaya. So the Mrindmaya is that which is territorial and you know, you have a border and stuff. And Chinmaya is that which is in the mind. I mean, I can be sitting here and claim to be a, a, a citizen of some other place because that's where my mind takes me. So fascinating ideas like this are coming, coming out. The Gondwana land idea, for example, for the tribals to have one nation. So many, many ideas came up. Uh, so this was the phase when the idea of post-independence, the idea of nationalism is still being questioned in films. So that's a film called Marma Yogi, where uh, he plays the role, M.G. Ramachandran plays the role of a traditional medicine man, an Ayurvedic physician. Uh, who also has this power of marma. Marma, of course, is the secret 64 points in the body. You can touch somewhere and either par paralyze a person or revive a person. So he plays that kind of a person. And uh, uh, basically, the marma yogi is a yogi who has the power to revive your society. He's not going to practice medicine on human beings, on society. He can revive the society, provided you give him a chance. <laughs> That's an appeal. That is Malay Kallan, Mountain Brigand. <coughs> uh, when uh, M.G. Ram, in, in this film, there is a sequence where mm, uh, uh, there, there's a fight sequence where the arm, the, the what do you call the sleeve of his uh, shirt tears, and from inside the sleeve. Out peeps the rise, rising sun. He's got a tattoo of a rising sun. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
So in 1973, when he split from the DMK and started his own Anna DMK, uh, he was not sure because ideologically there was no difference. It was a personality clash between Karunanidhi and, and uh, MGR, and uh, there was no. And he, MGR, who was a party treasurer, had accused uh, the DMK and Karunanidhi particularly of financial embezzlement. It's an accusation that's still continuing for him and his family. <laughs> There's no escape from that when that party, but that family comes. But uh, uh, since MGR was not sure who his constituency will be, how many people are actually my followers, he did an extraordinary thing. In early 1974, he had a massive meeting on Marina Beach in Chennai. Marina Beach has been a traditional place for big political meetings and half a million people can easily come there. Uh, yeah, much bigger than Chopati. And he organized similar meetings in Madurai, in Salem, and in Tirichi and Coimbatore, where large numbers of people come. MGR was there only in Madras, but uh, all, in all the other centers, party leaders were there, but large numbers of people came. And in front of the days, they or the party organized in Madras, uh, uh, the number is clear. They organized 180 tattoo artists to sit there. And the audience was asked to, as they passed by, get themselves tattooed with the party symbol or some other sign of loyalty, of personal branding. And a large number, millions of people, they say, got themselves, either MGR would be written or the party symbol was given as two leaves, so two leaves would be done, or uh, the party flag was a red and black thing, so they would do that, red, black and white, sorry. <coughs> and today, you can travel to many parts of Tamil Nadu and find <coughs> people, particularly men, having a strange white discoloration here. <laughs> and that's because they've got, eventually got disillusioned. <laughs> so they either show it to a flame and burn it out, or pour acid and take it out. So once again, it's a, it's a body thing, you know, that I see reality of it, that you give blood, you tattoo your body, you take it out. That I see reality that, that really underpins this whole cultural adventure that the Dravidian movement went through. Nadodi uh, Mannan, the king who ran away uh, because he was outlawed and then of course he returns to reclaim his seat and in set there is somebody has gone and put a MGR in power poster also in it so that's interesting. I mean street visuals are always quite fascinating the kind of uh, information they give you. Uh, I did my pen or the slave girl this is a, again a throwback to the Dravidian manifesto which talks about women's emancipation. This film is all about women's em emancipation. The only thing is the man delivers it to them. <laughs> <laughs> it's a parliamentary phase of uh, constituency building when the party uh, agrees to uh, join parliamentary politics and stand for elections and so on. So that's Padagoti or the traditional fisherman. He is undergoing cardiac surgery, obviously. Engavita <laughs> uh, Pillai, in which uh, the whip building MGR, it's a, it's a kind of a version of Ram or Sham. So uh, there is the very timid version of MGR, and this is a very swashbuckling version. And the swashbuckling version uh, delivers an entire village uh, from feudal injustice by cracking his whip. And that is the peasant, the Vivasai. <coughs> mm. Well, uh, he's playing uh, a school teacher in this. And uh, this could be a pretty elementary lesson on the slate. <laughs> This is appealing again to the rural community, Matukara Velen. Huge 40 foot cutout. Rikshakaran or Rikshawala. 
when this film was released in Chennai, a group of uh, uh, 250 cycle rickshaw pullers from Bangalore cycled all the way to Chennai to attend the first show uh, on the first day of the release of the film. And uh, MGR personally uh, came to give them all gold chains as a reward. So this was some, another thing that they used to do. The fan clubs had their own role to play in, in this whole thing, in the creation of the myth. Uh, the fan clubs would, uh, of course, be instrumental in uh, block capturing of seats for the first day sh shows. And that was, of course, traditional. I mean, it's a standard where uh, people would come in blocks of 30, 40, 50 people, and all the seats would be captured. Uh, but uh, in these long queues, on a rainy day, if you're standing in these long queues, the fan clubs would, uh, fan club members would arrive in lorries and trucks and give you umbrellas so that you didn't get wet. Uh, on summer days, they would give you buttermilk so that you didn't die of dehydration and so on. So they were very caring and, you know. <laughs> and this, of course, the film made immediately as they come, come to power, Kaval Karan, uh, policeman, the good good cop. I mean, he, he does only good. Now, Tamil Nadu today has the reputation of being the state with the largest number of encounter deaths. <laughs> it's not Gujarat, it's not Chhattisgarh, it's not Jharkhand, it's Tamil Nadu. No inquiries, no special judge commissions. Uh, Tamil Nadu is a state with the largest number in history of sedition cases. Currently, the big agitation going on, as many of you know, is the agitation against a nuclear plant in Kodankulam, uh, where uh, uh, three villages totaling 40,000, 45,000 people have come out en masse. They're sitting on the beach, and they're doing relay, hunger strike, etc., etc. Uh, 6,800 of them have been arrested and charged with sedition for sitting on hunger strike against a project that they're not very happy with. So Tamil Nadu has employed sedition in this particular manner, but even before, in the uh, uh, early 1980s, between 1979 and 1982, there were 368 people charged with sedition. Uh, I happen to be one of them. Uh, uh, and it included, you know, a 10-year-old boy who was watching a street play and uh, various, you know, chancy, random, anyone who questioned. I mean, I was charged with sedition because I wrote articles in Indian Express. <laughs> Baba, very difficult days. Mm, anyway, I'm, I'm saying it in a jocular way today because one fought the case and one got over it. But uh, when, when you go through it, you realize the the wretchedness of it, because under sedition, it's a colonial law, 124A, uh, uh, has no place in contemporary jurisprudence, because once you have uh, Section 19, freedom of speech, there cannot be sedition. But it's still in the statute books, it's still used by governments at will. Luckily, many governments have, have not been adventurous in using it so much. Uh, but the Tamil Nadu government under MGR went whole hog. Jailalitha has continued it, and uh, it's it's a scandal today. You can't have if there are 6,800 people doing sedition. I mean, it's like imagining 6,800 Bhagat Singhs. I mean, your society will be blown apart. So it's it's, it's a travesty of the whole thing. It's a bit like uh, the Dramatic Performances Act of 1876, which is still in the statute books. It still uh, is a nuisance for theatre people. Uh, because it's used. When, whenever some administration want or local thana wants, they use it. Uh, but nobody has, uh, no government has you know, repealed it. It has gone, gone away in about 14 states of India, but still it's there in many states. So Tamil Nadu is, by any long shot, a police state today. Then, of course, this very interesting thing, which is, can only be called the politics of food, uh, many of you have heard that uh, the present Chief Minister Jayalalitha has started a whole chain of new uh, uh, unavalayams or you know eating places where you can get cheap food, idli for one rupee, vada for one rupee, pungal for one rupee, etc. 
and uh, <clears throat> very soon they're going to bring in sweets also into it, etc. And it's a fantastic way of uh, uh, sort of getting voter uh, affiliation, voter uh, loyalty, much better than food security bill, etc. I think it's got much more power to it. <laughs> Seriously, it's very, it's very close. But MGR's tactic was this. It's called the midday meal scheme, and uh, across the state. State, you will find these kind of street graphics, paintings on the wall, uh, what MGR did to uplift the uh, lot of uh, young children in school. I mean, I personally think it's a very progressive thing. It, uh, uh, it, it looks very funny, but uh, the number of children it brought back to school is, uh, is amazing. The statistics are very, very good. And uh, the fact that the delivery of food itself became better and better as it went along, uh, I mean, there's no gain saying the fact that it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a project that even UNESCO recommended, and now most states in India follow this. The midday meal has come to stay. But it's, it's this whole thing, you know, who is paying for this? And MSS Pandian has a very interesting analysis. He worked in the Madras Institute of Development Studies and using his friends from the economics uh, section, uh, they created a, a kind of a flow chart of where is this money coming from? I mean, if you need five crores a month to, do, uh, to, to feed about uh, something like uh, three and a half lakh children, uh, plus have the staff to cook and have some shed where you'll do so where, where is this money coming from? Interestingly, the money was coming from uh, liquor excise. Who was drinking liquor? The parents of these very same kids. <laughs> so he was just rotating that money. He was not touching the rich at all. There was no super tax on the rich to feed. I mean, after all, that's how that's what a true egalitarian taxing system would do. But here, this peculiar hoax was being played. So, more of the midday meal. And then, of course, this is a constant thing during MGR's regime, the, that he would look after elderly women, wipe the tears from their eyes. Very noble. And then how this seeps into popular culture, the iconography of MGR. So you'll have auto rickshaws with this kind of super graphics on them, cycle rickshaws. This, by the way, is a cycle rickshaw with an MGR shrine. Wow. Yeah, it's a, it's a traveling temple. And uh, there's a hundi, and you can drop a coin, and he will give you some sacred ash, and all sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And of course, on t-shirts and bunions, and why not? If they can have Superman, we can have our own. <laughs> this is a greeting card sent during Pongal. Pongal is the New Year festival in Tamil Nadu. Not New Year, it's a harvest festival, but Pongal cards are very ubiquitous, they're very common. So the three words there, Kadamai, Kanniyam, Kattupad, that is the um, slogan of the DMK movement. Uh, Kadamai means duty, duty towards uh, society. Uh, Kanniyam means uh, uh, honor. Uh, in a strange way, it, 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 it sits well with, with the word chastity. So honor belongs to the female department. Uh, and kattupada meaning uh, determination or whatever. And then this uh, is something that has fascinated me and uh, those who travel in Tamil Nadu will still find this going on, the sheer power of the graphic language. Meaning, I may be an illiterate, I can't read what's going on there. Well, actually, what's written is MGR, and it's a kind of a reception for him, uh, I mean, in, in his honor somewhere. But that play with alphabets, with calligraphy, with color, uh, on a super scale, uh, there, there are, you, you can have the same MGR written over a 
300 foot long wall, uh, perfectly sized and perfectly arranged and uh, with wonderful you know, spaces in between and very sculptural. So this whole craft that grew uh, simultaneously in the, in the urban scapes. And then uh, <clears throat> I, I did all these photographs in the course of another project, and that project is what I'm showing now, where when you have these kind of posters on the street, certain kind of peculiar conversations begin to happen with, with the image and what's happening on the street. So for example, the same Marma Yogi uh, is against this garbage bin and the boy who's picking from the garbage bin. Uh, and the irony of the fact that this whole tall claim to being a yogi who can, or a, or a vaidya who can solve the ills of society uh, has not been able to touch the reality. You know, the reality remains either the same or even worse. Or this is a common reality. Uh, Tamil Nadu again has the honor of being the largest generator of plastic waste in India. This of course is true irony. The film is called Panakkara Kudumam, the rich man's family. And the rich man's family you can see below, the pots and pans in the kitchen that is running. So the contradiction between the claim and what is actually there. And this of course a very clever shopkeeper who decided to sell his hit pair, <laughs> hit Jodi. <coughs> they are chin to chin, so he's also arranged his chapels like that. And extremely clever choice of a site for a shop. Now, I mean, I, I keep thinking, uh, whenever I look at this picture uh, in the mid-90s, some of you will remember that horrible morning in Mumbai, in Ghatkopar, when people woke up and found a garland of chapels around an Ambedkar statue, and the whole riots that it led to, and then the funeral processions, and more riots, and more shooting, and over 13 people dying, just because of a chapel garland. and. Uh, this kind of chapel garland doesn't seem to <laughs> create anything like that. And uh, this is a, a film called Kudumbat Talaiban, or the head of the family. Now, my project was actually this, which was to go very close to the image and using a normal lens photograph, for example, first if you photograph from two and a half feet away, you will get only the goggles which is the image you saw right in the beginning. Then you take two steps back, then you see the full face. Then you take two steps back, then you see much of the poster. Then you take another two steps back. By that time, you're already in the middle of the road. <laughs> and from there, when you take, you see the family that this man is the head of. <laughs> and the deprivation and the you know condition of the family. So it was a project I initiated to sort of uh, look at the semiotics of street uh, you know, images and understand them differently. Yeah, so I could finish now quickly. Uh, I think I've probably extended my time beyond uh, your patience. But uh, this is a, a subcultural phenomena that happened where this actor you're seeing in this, in this cutout, uh, I don't know if anybody recognizes him. He's a superstar today. His name is Vijay Kant. And Vijay Kant has started his own new party called DMDK. Uh, but when he first came to films, the film that he acted in, already MGR had started, I mean, stopped uh, acting in films. So in the first film that this man acts in, he is a nincompoop. 
he can't do anything right. He's just come from the village to the city of Chennai and he can't do anything right. <clears throat> and every day he, something happens, something is stolen, he gets beaten, he gets cheated, something happens to him and he goes back home crying. And his mother tells him, what a stupid fellow you are. Why did I give birth to a child like you, a son like you? You are no good. Go and watch an MGR film. <laughs> then you will understand how what life is. So dutifully, being a dutiful son, he goes and watches an MGR film. And he presto, his entire consciousness changes. He comes out of the uh, theater, he goes to one of those t-shirt shops, he buys this t-shirt, wears it, immediately his muscles flare up, and then so on. And he proceeds to beat up all those people whom, who were troubling him, and then on to save society and all. But this, uh, there were at least a dozen films of this kind that came after MGR, so-called retired from, from films, because uh, that, that charisma was still working, and uh, this was one of the guys who benefited from it. And this was a famous moment in 1983 when M.G. Ramachandran was given a doctorate by the Madras University, one of the biggest universities in the country. Uh, gives him a full-fledged doctorate, D.Lit. And in the speech, in the acceptance speech, and this I think is very important and I'm, I'm very glad to narrate this. Somebody asked him, the, the, the vice chancellor of the university who was, uh, I'm sorry, uh, as he was receiving his uh, D.Lit, he announced uh, a grant to Madras University in return to start a department of Annaism. So the Vice Chancellor, when he came up for the Thanksgiving, said, but sir, what is Annaism? <laughs> so, NGR came back to the mic and he said, Annaism is a mix of the philosophy of our dear Talaivar leader, uh, C.N. Annadurai, uh, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, and Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. <laughs> that he said this in full. <laughs> and for me, it's fantastic that even at that stage, the influence of the uh, old Bolshevik, E.V. Uh, Ramaswaminaikar, who indoctrinated all these people into this particular political line, that influence was still strong, that Lenin meant something to them. For me, the midday meal scheme for children is a part of that, that idea of social welfare is there somewhere in the consciousness, whether it's, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, the politics to do is a different, different debate, but the idea of social welfare somehow is extremely uh, uh, central to the Dravidian movement and its politics, the way it has played out. It's a different matter that it did not kill caste. It's a different matter that once, uh, if you take the statistics, 1947, India gains independence, 1967, 20 years later, DMK comes to power. Between 47 and 67, there are two or three caste clashes in Tamil Nadu. I think three. Uh, between upper caste and Dalits. Between 1967 and today, there are over 280 caste clashes. Where it's the Harijans who are getting the brunt of it. The Dalits, the Adi Dravidas who are getting the brunt of it. They are being uh, you know, treated in a manner that you can't imagine in a state that claims social welfare. So that is a big myth. And uh, to me, it's the power of this kind of cultural indoctrination that we still don't ask that question. That, you know, we don't talk back to that power and say, where is your claim? How can you get away with this? How can you live in a society where every day there is a caste clash, every day you are eliminating uh, Dalits, uh, every day you are aggrandizing them, and uh, so on and so forth. I mean, in the most horrendous kind of ways. So, while cultural politics has its positive uh, possibilities, its negative possibilities can be even more frightful. So, for me, the, in conclusion, the uh, only way out is for a conscious citizenry 
to do do this to to do this to them sweep them away in some gust of wind where a different kind of social justice a different idea of social justice can prevail uh, once again i'm very glad that uh, i could be here in memory of uh, bapat sahab uh, often people have asked me how would you describe ram bapat and uh, unhesitatingly i have said for me he represents the walter benjamin of india a, a man who thought extensively read extensively wrote very little and yet influenced such a vast range of uh, the thinking community and the activist community and uh, it's with great uh, humbleness that i thank you for inviting me thank you a mere formality in a manner of speaking there is very little to add to the to the really the torrential wisdom <laughs> uh, in in case of case of the words it it struck me as extraordinary that for a man who really you know in a sense had a uh, had a certain contempt for the world there is a there is a very french uh, there was a french critic who wrote an article in around 1926 or so i heard, read a reference where he calls the 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 louvre the famous paris 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 museum the the louvre of the written word the written word is like like a, like a shell it should be uh, a community class of community uses it but it it simply remains a sign nothing else it becomes either it loses its life or alternately attributes all kinds of different different dif different meanings to it and then you it is like walking on the on the beach the seashell there could be something else and then he says well uh, next generation perhaps the same words will be used by by scoundrels and we we got some 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 measure of that that phenomenon in the tamil nadu tamil nadu account in in a way but well, my friend would have been very very happy for this celebration of word in his memory he knew and then there was a there was a way of basically the basically uh, it it has always seemed to me although he would he would smile and dismiss my quite often he used to do that when he wanted to be sweet about rejecting my formation <laughs> he 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 would smile and say yes yes there is a point in what you say and the moment the uh, 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 peculiar thing about him was that almost everybody who went to him with his writing or whatever came away with the impression that babat has liked it <laughs> now it cannot be it cannot be that he liked all, all that was presented to him could, could not have been but the point is that he always begin by saying that once he said you see i cannot take any other position than this because otherwise it is telling him that your project is worthless and who am i to say that his project is worthless all projects are worthwhile it's how you generate meanings what kind of associations you give give give, give to those meanings and then you know as 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 nagarjun said once that abhidhanat prathak bhutva abhideyam na vidyate and it's a word for it you cannot describe it that is that is the word he was and that therefore there was his very famous uh, 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 takya kalam of his was thikani always babu was very, very fond of this word thikani that thikani ya thikani in other words he, then you start getting a feeling oh my god this thought is traveling he was he was a perhaps the only man in the present day present day maharashtra for whom thought was moving it was moving him it was moving every 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 everyone else uh, this the uh, uh, this lure of the and he made sure that his thought did not become a lure you see the the, the uh, his thought was alive 
kicking, almost hitting. And he had a nice way of hitting you. You still got away with the impression, oh my God, Baba liked it. <laughs> and he might have, might have offered some of the most pungent, pungent criticism. He was, he was perhaps the only man in the present day, present day Maharashtra for whom thought was moving. It was moving him, it was moving every, 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 everyone else. <coughs> this, uh, uh, this lure of the... And he made sure that his thought did not become a lure. You see, the, 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 his thought was alive, kicking, almost hitting. And he had a nice way of hitting you. <laughs> you still got away with the impression, oh my God, Baba liked it. And he might have, might have offered some of the most pungent, pungent criticism. There is the only, only, only thing I once, once told him, that the only thing I feel jealous, jealous about, as far as you are concerned, everybody gets away with, with, with the feeling from you that you have appreciated them, you have liked them, and everybody gets away from me, definitely was almost certain, not, not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's it. Anyway, one can, one can, one can, one can go on. Uh, I will. I, I must stop here. It's quite, quite, quite late, really. There is a very famous uh, line from the from the Santas, which I, which, I, which, I, which I am very fond of. I will, I will conclude with that. But before that, let me personally thank uh, Sadanan for the. I don't have to describe to you what you got, but he he agreed to do all this for. Is uh, uh, really. I think we should remember, remember this journey, and I hope you do too. <laughs> and and then, of course, the other thing is that I must also express my gratitude to uh, Makaran and and Gajanan for doing me this singular singular honor. There is a book of mine which I have dedicated to Bapat, where I had said, "Ya bhikshu tola pustak, tola tuzo pustak yeshe jasa tangla asa lava hoto he mala manne." I think something similar I am required to say. Kuditri Maja Baksha, just Shahana Surta Manusha, it has a lot. The Santojan Sanktoni, some bodu. Vistare Bolata, Bahuto Prakar, Huilo Ushiro Atapuri.